Uh, good morning to the conference. Uh, today lecture is about pain of spinal origin. We are going to outline a few topics in the lecture. The first one will be the epidemiology and financial impact. Then we, we go through the basic anatomy, definitions of spinal pain, evaluation, referral patterns, and pain syndromes, and management of chronic spinal pain. Uh, men and women are basically equally affected, but uh, women tend to report more uh, pain more, often, more frequently, especially after the age 60. Um, in comparison, the annual incidence of acute spinal pain is 5%, and the lifetime prevalence of pain ranges from 60 to 90%. Chronic pain is the m one of the most common, if not most common, condition for which people seek medical treatment. It is estimated that 35% of Americans suffer from chronic pain. Either this is the neuropathic pain or somatic pain, back pain, uh, joint pain. Over 50 million Americans are partially or totally disabled by chronic pain. 50 million workdays are usually lost per year and nearly 100 billion are estimated annual costs in lost productivity, medical costs and loss of income as of American Pain Society in 2001. The anatomy, uh, typically um, we're going to focus on uh, the, one of the most common complaints of chronic pain, which is the lumbar spine. Uh, there are three different compartments that we can consider that generate the pain. The posterior elements and the facet joint, the middle neuroaxial compartment, and anterior vertebral bodies and intervertebral discs. In the posterior elements, the most common pain generator is the facet joint. The middle neural compartment is the spinal nerve root and anterior vertebral compartment is the vertebral body and uh, anterior parts of the vertebral discs. Posterior compartment, common findings, nerve supply via dorsal primary ramus. At the junction of the SAP and TP, uh, medial branch is located that supplies the facet joints, and another branch uh, branches out into the lateral parts of the paraspinal area. Um, disc innervation and spinal nerve root, as we can see on the picture on the left, the posterior part of the disc is supplied by sinovertebral nerve. Um, they are lateral and anterior mostly by the gray ramus. Um, the posterior compartment, uh, we can see the posterior primary ramus that branches out into a lateral branch and a middle branch. And the middle compartment, we have the spinal nerve root and the tickle sac. Innervation of the dural sleeve is primarily through the meningeal recurrent nerve that goes okay. next sources of spinal pain uh, it's quite difficult to differentiate between clinically between the different origins of the spinal pain. The most common structures are the musculoskeletal structure secondary, uh, gener pain generator secondary to, to spinal pathology, fascia joints, sacroiliac joints, discs, vertebral bodies. Initial evaluation. Um, what's very important is to start from the basic pain history that should include obviously the duration and the onset of pain, rule out possible involvement of vascular infections or malignant etiology, and pay attention to concerning signs that is <coughs> unintentional weight loss, night sweats, history of cancer in the family, and cord compression symptoms. Uh, next, uh, you know, f focuses on identifying patients' risk for disability, psychological status, secondary gain issues, uh, as well as the uh, drug seeking behavior um, re and um, uh, judgment of the uh, pain response to the initial titration of medications. Um, 
that focuses on functional improvement and also um, very in consideration for pseudo addiction issues. The next step is the focus evaluation of the actual pain generator. Uh, typically, we can distinguish pain syndromes based on the duration, acute less than six weeks of duration, subacute between six and 12 weeks, and chronic greater than 12 weeks duration. The next step, we basically ask patients where the patient feels pain, and patients will simply refer, um, point into the area indicating the location where they feel the most significant pain. Uh, the next step is basically trying to identify whether the pain has any radiation patterns. Whether this matter or not is, is another matter, right? Uh, common areas of spinal pain. The most common one is the lumbar region, uh, gluteal re region, sacral region, and the thoracic spine, especially the one between the scapular blades. Radiation versus somatic pain. Uh, we need here to differentiate between somatic or neuropathic pain, like right, radiculopathy, diffusion hard to localize, and um, whether or not the pain has achy quality. There are three zones of the primary pain that is referred from the lumbar spine. The primary area is basically uh, across the waistline to the sacral area, the secondary pain posterior thighs and the tertiary pain area can spread below the knees into the, from the popliteal fossa toward the heels. Cervical facet and patterns, as we can see, it's quite overlapping. The middle part of the cervical spine from the C45 up tends to refer pain more toward the occipital area, anterior, uh, uh, lateral anterior neck and the shoulder and uh, lower uh, cervical spine area from C45 uh, down tends to refer the pain toward the shoulder blades, interscapular area, and, uh, and posterior shoulder. Okay. In the lumbar uh, facet patterns, typically the pain is referred into the pelvic crest, the gluteal area, and into the flanks and sometimes you can cross the midline and uh, be referring to the anterior parts of the thighs and groin and even the um, periambulical area. Okay. Uh, next is the differentiation between the radicular um, pain. The characteristics typically are shooting or lacinating pain uh, caused by the traction and damage nerve roots. Many may or may not be associated with radiculopathy. Um, term sciatica still exists. It's quite common, commonly used. That refers to the inflammation of spinal nerve root. The most common cause of the radicular pain is a disc herniation that uh, progresses into a chemical inflammation, release of phospholipase A2 and peripheral sensitization. Somatic pain typically coexists with the radicular pain. Uh, it's usually it's myofascial. Um, in the peripheral sensitization, there are a lot of uh, chemical mediators involved that form what we can call sensitizing soup that includes hydrogen ions, noradrenaline, bradykinin, histamine, potassium ions, all the way through the neuropeptides. The sensitizing soup causes a decreased threshold of nociceptors, ectopic discharges in the uh, inflammation area and abnormal accumulation of sodium channels. Axial versus radicular pain patterns. The axial pain is typically located in the center of the lumbar spine with some referral pattern toward the sacrum. Um, and radicular pain typically is referred into the buttock area down the lower extremity. Uh, on the right we have a picture that depicts the uh, locations of pain uh, caused by the different nerve root uh, inflammation. The L4, typically the pain patients will feel into the lateral tie toward the knee, whereas numbness they mostly will feel on the middle portion of the, of the knee, and the motor weakness will be 
evident by the examining extension of the quadriceps. The screaming exam is basically squatting and reflexes uh, we check for the knee jerk is usually diminished. The L5 pattern typically the pain extends all the way toward the lateral ankle uh, with numbness in the lateral uh, shin. Uh, the screening exam it's heel walking and there are no reliable reflexes. And the S1 is through the posterior portion of the thigh, posterior hamstrings all the way down toward the uh, lateral ankle, heel, and um, lateral aspect of the foot. The skinny exam is walking on the toes, and ankle jerk usually is diminished. Common myofascial pain patterns um, are quite different from the patient to patient. However, there are some similarities, especially when it comes to a, a characteristic of the diffuse pain in the paraspinal area going toward the, the sacroiliac joint with trigger point forms in typical locations that is around the pelvic crest, uh, sciatic notch and uh, the location of the piriformis. Management. Uh, pain is very difficult to diagnose clinically sometimes and for that reason, uh, quite often we will employ uh, diagnostic uh, injections. One of the most common is the diagnostic facet joint injection, which is a false negative rating about 8%. Typically, the second confirmatory injection will be necessary. It is advised to use different concentrations of local, uh, different, uh, local anesthetics with different du duration of, of, uh, of time. Uh, facet joints injections itself uh, intra-articular um, are usually 30% uh, are usually false positive response and a second injection typically will have to be performed um, that can reduce the diagnostic um, uh, value of the of the faster joint injection typically what we will do is uh, uh, we will do the medial branch blocks of the facet joints that have a higher value of uh, diagnosis. Blind injections are not recommended. Um, there is quite often epidural spread. There was estimated to be 70% of subjects and 30% exclusively. Once the patients go through the series of the positive facet joint blocks, may not might be a good candidate for thermal or pulse radiofrequency of the middle branch that carries uh, pain improvement between 50 to 60 percent with duration of pain relief for the pulse about six and thermal about 12 months. Is that again? Pulse? Six, si about six months and thermal 12 months. There is no need to do both. Okay. Um, another common injection performed is are epidural steroid injections. Uh, which approach to use uh, has been a quite a debate. Um, typically, the studies show that intralaminar and transferaminar injections are equally effective. However, uh, the other issue is whether or not to do a series of three uh, injections uh, or just uh, to perform one with uh, following injections uh, with regards to the degree of pain relief and du du duration. Um, the selected nerve root blocks or transforaminal epidural injections have slight advantage over the intralaminar, but that basically uh, refers to the lower volume, higher concentration of the position of the steroid medication at the side of the pathology they can have diagnostic utility compared to the intralaminar. The intralaminar have higher volume, lower concentration, have poor diagnostic utility, and uh, one of the intralaminar, um, actually, and in other injections, the codon injections is typically um, are, have same values as the intralaminar. Uh, sacroiliac joint injections, um, the post two innervations, the posterior part and the anterior part. The posterior part is innervated from the L3 down to S3. 
Uh, the L5 and S1 and S2 branches innervate 90% of the posterior part. And the anterior innervation of the side joint is L2 to S2 segments, which uh, L3 down to L5 innervate 90% of the anterior portion of the sacroiliac joints. Quite commonly, you will have either the uh, superior or the inferior part of the sacroiliac joints being involved in the generation of the pain. Obviously, it is much more difficult to perform diagnostic injection for the sacroiliac joint if the interior part is involved. Uh, sometimes what we will do, we will, block, uh, we will block selectively the nerve branches that supply the sacroiliac joint. Uh, those techniques typically are used prior to radiofrequency of the sacroiliac joints of the, or, or the branches supplying the, the, the joint. Okay. Uh, discogenic pain, um, as I mentioned before, the discs are innervated primarily by the uh, sinovertebral nerve. The most common etiology is the internal disc disruption. Um, the test used for diagnosis of IDD pain is provocative discography. Okay. Uh, typically, pain generated from the dis uh, discs have normal neuro exam and imaging is questionable. Uh, treatment of the internal disc disruption used for uh, quite a while at this point is chemical or medical um, intradiscal electrothermocoagulation. The prevalence of this IDD pain is about 40%. Other options of treatment of uh, spinal pain, pharmacotherapy, uh, rehabilitation, psychological interventions, anesthesiological approaches, as we mentioned above, uh, injections, neurostimulator techniques, surgery, and uh, complementary alternative approaches and lifestyle changes. Summary. Um, it is shown that about 80% um, of spinal pain may be diagnosed. If, uh, on the contrary, the appropriate techniques are utilized. Diagnosis is possible about 75% of cases. The pretest chances of IDD is very high, uh, being around 40%. Pretest chances of being a facet joint pain is about 15%, which is much lower. Injured workers and 40% uh, of for older patients. Um, typically have the facet joint pain. Pre-test chance of being sacroiliac joint pain is about 20%. Uh, treatment differs based on whether this is chronic pain or acute spinal pain. And uh, each time we consider the differentiation of the spinal pain, we have to bear in mind that three most common areas is the discogenic pain, the facetogenic pain, and facial pain. Yes. Uh, for well, you use the transformular approach if typically if you have a single nerve root involvement, right, that is backed up by the uh, evidence of the neuroforamen narrowing herniation of the discs, uh, stenosis of the neuroforamen. So f my answer would be rather use the intralaminar. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Intradiscal injections are typically. Done.